pray with you before we start. Yes. Father, I pray to us the word you have given him to give to us. I pray that you would anoint him now, Lord, to give that word, and you would open our ears and our hearts to receive it and be blessed by it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks. Evening, everyone. Evening. I'm on. Uh, Brenda's going to read the text for, uh, for me. It's uh, Romans 6 tonight. I, I felt the Lord wanted me to preach this last year, I think. I spoke to Ken on the phone. Way, way. This is on, yes? It's loud. Oh, she's got one. Um, so I feel this was the, the, what he wanted me to bring. Just say, I'm from Amitalari, from a church there, Ebenezer. Um, I brought um, one of our crew, Jack, with me tonight. We're going to minister at the end and, and pray for people. Um, Jack often gives words of knowledge in our, in our services there. So I said, come, come down tonight, I'm going to put you on this spot. Give some words. So he's been writing stuff down through the service. He had, had a word when we were praying out the back. So at the end of the service, he'll put some of those out. But we'll pray for you anyway, just to say. So you, if one of the words, for example, is a little bit, oh, just everyone, if everyone comes up, you won't know whose word is what, and you can just tell him personally, yeah? You know what I'm saying? Okay. The reading is from Romans chapter 6, verses 1 to 8. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead to the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. Amen. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master, because you are not under the law, but under grace. Amen. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. Thanks be to God. Cheers, Brenda. Well, Romans is known as the the doctrinal book in the Bible. Doctrine means instruction, especially as it uh, relates to lifestyle. So this letter written by the Apostle Paul to the Christians in Rome is aimed at teaching God's truth so that they may apply it to have a changed life. Anybody here want a changed life? Yeah. Or more change? Yeah, okay, you're with me. Because to have a changed life can be a struggle because of sin. It's a problem. It gets in the way. It messes stuff up. Now in this chapter, or sorry, in the chapter before this one, Paul explains that all of us have, have got this sin nature. Even, even babies have it. It's the desire to live for ourselves. And the old sin nature, the Bible tells us, comes from Adam, the story of Adam and Eve in Genesis there, the father of the human race. It's been passed down. And because you are a human like I am a human, 
you get part of the human nature. It's the bad news, yeah? The bad news. There's good news to come. That's the bad news first. And it's that nature that you want to be your own boss. You want to be your own God. It's a nature that all of us have inherited. And so the question is, how do I break the power of my old nature? How do I do that? Any, Jesus. Yeah, exactly. Any, any head scratches here? Yeah. Because you can't break it on your own, can you? Otherwise you wouldn't need uh, Jesus. But you do. But the fact is that Jesus has already broken it. And what we're going to see tonight is how we can appropriate that to our lives. Okay? Now in the chapter before this, chapter 5, Paul explains that God is prepared to see us as thoroughly justified in his sight, just as if we'd never sinned. He's prepared to see us as justified in his sight. And uh, that those who are in Christ are declared to be righteous. But it's one thing to know that you're accepted, to know I'm accepted. But how do I break the power of sin? How do I walk free? And so in Romans 6, it's a big, it's a big passage, uh, just to say, some of you may know the, the famous Welsh uh, preacher, Martin Lloyd-Jones. You familiar with him? Yeah. I mean, one of the best, isn't he? Um, he didn't preach from the book of Romans for 30 years on the basis that he wanted to do a good job of it. You know? yeah. I've only been a minister, I think, what was it? Six or seven or something now. And... Um, and he said that Romans 6 for him was perhaps the most liberating passage in the whole of Scripture. So a very important text tonight. So in Romans 6, Paul tells us some things we need to know and some things we need to do. Yes, yeah, some things we need to? And some things we need to? Exactly. Okay, you're with me. Now Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Can you get that verse up there on the screen? There you go. Jesus said, you'll know the truth and the, the truth will set you free. So freedom isn't about how you feel. Do I feel free? No. It's not about feeling. It's about truth. Truth that is declared by God. Jesus said, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. Why don't you turn to someone tonight and tell them the truth will set you free. Tell someone, the truth will set you free, brother. The truth will set you free. The truth will set you free. Yeah. If you're someone you've come here tonight and you're interested in spiritual gifts and you thought, well, I've never prophesied, you just have. You've just proclaimed God's word over someone, a truth over them. You've just prophesied. Amen. So freedom has nothing to do with how I feel. Uh, it's to do with God's truth and what he proclaims. Let's get this uh, into Romans. The next verse, Romans 6, 3. Let's get it up on the screen. Here we go. So don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? He begins by using the word know. Yeah? Now notice some points. He says, and he says, all of us. It's a statement about Christians. So in chapter 5, the chapter before this, I'm just going to summarize. Um, he speaks about all of us because of Adam. What happened to all of us because of Adam? Adam sinned and we were all ruined. Yeah? We became children of disobedience. And, and Adam wrecked the human race, essentially. His sin somehow is accredited to our account. The bad news of Romans 5. Adam's mess up gets accredited uh, to us. But then Paul contrasts that in, in Romans 6, what we've got here. And in Christ, Christ's righteousness is accredited to us. We're declared righteous because of Jesus. And it's, it's a matter of not being in Adam, but being in Jesus. Do you see that? Now, now, here's the thing. There's no third category. Yeah? There's not, well, there's those who are in Adam, and there's those who are in Jesus, and then there's those really super fantastic Christians who've actually died to sin and have been set free. Do you see that? There's not three categories. You're either uh, with Adam's camp, or you're with Jesus. And just to say, there's anyone here this evening and you haven't made your peace with God. You haven't trusted Jesus as your saviour. Let me invite you to do that this evening. It'll be the best thing that you ever, ever did. You might say to me, well, what's in it for me? What do I get out of it? I mean, let me give you just a few basics here and there. A clear conscience. How about that? Peace of mind. To live with peace of mind, with a clear conscience. Also, you, you get peace in the present. Many of you have felt the tangible presence of the Holy Spirit here this evening. You get that peace, and you get a place in heaven. 
There's, there's, loads, there's loads more, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. At that interest, Junior think, oh, I could do with peace of mind. <laughs> I could do to live guilt-free. I'm weighed down with it. Well, the, the whole Jesus thing is for you. It, it really is. It's, it's tailor-made. He said, I, he said, I didn't come for the healthy. I came for the sick. I came for those who recognize, oh, I need help in this. If that's you tonight and you haven't done that, um, I'll, I'll walk you through with that later. Come and see me and just say, look, I want in, and I'll say, let's, let's jump in on that, okay? So, there's no third uh, category at all. So, if, you, if, you, if you're not in Adam, uh, and, and you've chosen to be in Christ, then this, this, this is true, what we're already speaking about. Um, the tense he speaks about, isn't it something, it's not about something that's going to happen. You know? Don't you know that, that, that uh, when you've, since you've been baptized, in Christ, at some point in the future, uh, that something's going to happen. No, he's saying it's already happened now. Something has already happened to us now that God says is true, that we've been set free from the power of sin. <coughs> just let, let this just settle down on you a minute. It's nothing about how you feel. Feeling is irrelevant. It's about the truth of what God says is the truth that we live by. And what does he say? He says, there's something you need to know. That our old self, our old man, was crucified with Jesus. That's what we need to know because God says it's true. So what's the first step in walking free from being set free from sin, from the power of sin, from it having its claws into us? It's knowing something is true. That my old self, my old nature, the person I was before I gave my life to Christ, in some supernatural, mysterious way, was crucified when Christ was crucified. When he died, my old man, my old person, my old nature also died. Now you may say to me tonight, well, Jay, I, I'm having difficulty believing that. You should, have seen, you should have seen my temper yesterday. Or you should have seen me when I was alone the other day, what I got up to. I don't feel very crucified. But the Bible says you have been. Let me give you a question this evening. If you're a believer here tonight, how many of you believe that when Jesus was crucified, he was crucified with a criminal on one side and a criminal on the other? How many of you believe that? Raise your hand you believe that. Now, why do you believe that? Because the Bible tells me so, yeah? Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible, because the Bible tells me so. Well, the same Bible says you were crucified with Christ. The same Bible. And he who died is free from sin. <laughs> Sin's since only got control on an alive person. It's got no hold on a dead person. Okay? So our freedom from sin was accomplished by Jesus, not by law, not by willpower, not by letting go, but by Jesus on the cross. He broke the power of sin in our lives. He died, we died with him. And the first thing that Paul says is, we need to know it. If you don't know that information, there's nothing you can do. The change starts with knowing something, and it trickles down now. It's what we're looking to happen in our Christian lives. We're looking for the word to become flesh. Can I get an amen? Yeah, amen on that one. That's what we're looking uh, to happen. The second thing tonight that he says, uh, it's in verse 11. Let's get to verse 11 up. Here we go. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Now, some, some different translations, some have consider, some have reckon. Many of you know that one, reckon yourselves. Other ones is count. Other translations, regard. Regard yourself, consider yourself dead to sin. So the first step is to know it. You know, to know it's true. It's true because God says it's true. And God is a higher court than any reality we may think we have here. And God says that my old self, your old self, was crucified alongside with Jesus. So secondly, he says the first thing, to know it. The second thing he says is to reckon it, to consider it so. Now, Paul borrows this world, word from the world of accountancy. He often borrows word, words. And it essentially means a sort of lining things up in columns, as an accountant would. You know, the numbers make sense. For those of you that use Excel or spreadsheets, you'll know instantly if something doesn't add up, there's a problem, you know? So it all lines up, it's all, reckon it to be true, consider it, just like a, a mathematician, two plus two is four. Boom, boom, 
Looking it to be true. There it is. Consider it. Reckon it. Accept it. So the second step is reckoning. And you might say to me, well, are you saying it's sort of mind over matter then? Just sort of believe hard. I really believe. I've died to sin. I've died to sin. I've died to sin. Well, no. No. He's saying it's true. It's already happened. God has said that it's happened. So just, just consider it. An illustration, illustration on this. I remember the first time I went abroad alone, uh, about 22, 23 or something, Portuguese friend, and we went, we went to Spain. And when we arrived there um, in Alicante, the pilot says, oh, it's five o'clock or whatever, and I looked at my watch, and my watch says, four o'clock. And I thought to myself, oh, well, must, guys must have got it wrong, you know? Pilot and all the rest of it. But what do I find out? Surprise, surprise. They're one hour ahead of us. <clears throat> Reckon it to be true. Because it is true. Consider it to be true. When you're in Spain, change your watch. When you're in Christ, you change what you think because you know it to be true. Yeah? Be with me. Uh, it's, I mean, here's the main part. I spoke about this last time. It's a matter of identity. Who you believe you are will affect how you live. If you believe you're a victim, you live as a, as a victim, no? If you, if you believe all you are is hurt, then, then you'll never, your arms will never be open enough to receive the healing that God would have you, have you receive. If you believe you're without sin, <laughs> I don't know what to say about that, you'll be a religious person, like the Pharisee. But who you, are will, who you believe you are and your identity will dictate uh, how you live. And, and so, many, so many believers, I meet so many Christians, and at the root of it they still feel that they're a sinner and they'll always sin. Almost like God's given it a kind of cloak of righteousness. You know the, the, the story of the prodigal son? Where the guy goes off and he spends all the father's money, he ends up eating with pigs, and then he realises what he's done, and he goes back and asks forgiveness. And the, and the father wraps this cloak around him, this, this robe. And I, I think sometimes people, they're confused, and they, they almost think that underneath the robe, it still smells of pig. It's only the outside that's been changed. But no, 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 that's not what the Bible says. And so that the matter of identity is crucial. A, a, a Christian... It, um, a Christian is a person who has been made righteous who sins sometimes. Not a sinner who's being made righteous. Now you might say, it's not just a play on words there. It's not, because it's a matter of identity. That you are declared as righteous. You are righteous. And often people get this confused. I've done it myself in the past, years ago, before I grasped this from, from Romans 6. I'm, I'm, I'm leading the, the, the communion, the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper at the table, and, I, and I'll say something like, oh, well, you know, but we're all sinners, but Christ died for us. But I've realized, no, 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 no. If you're a Christian, we all were sinners. Amen. But if you're a Christian, you're not a sinner anymore. Now you may say, behold, you know, if I'm drinking, I'm a drinker. If I'm running, I'm a runner. If I'm playing, I'm a player. If I'm looking, I'm a looker. Surely if I'm sinning, I'm a sinner. Not if you're a Christian. You're a righteous person who sins sometimes, not a sinner being made righteous. It's fundamental uh, uh, to get that right in your head. Liberating. Liberating, isn't it? When you stand there, I'm righteous. I'm righteous. Uh, incredible. There's been a massive identity change. So, knowing my own self was crucified with Christ, put to death, and then reckon it, consider it to be so. When in Spain, change your watch. You know? Now, sometimes if you think, if you went to the States or something, or Brazil, my wife's Brazilian, it takes a long time to get there. You've got to change your watch, watch a lot now. It takes a lot more reckoning. And sometimes that's what it's like in maybe some of your lives. You've got to reckon a little bit harder than someone else to reckon it true for whatever baggage you're carrying. But tonight I've come to proclaim God's word. And the truth will set you free. And that's what God says. That in Jesus, you are declared righteous. You are righteous. Okay? So the first thing we're going to do is know something. You know, you're, you're, you've been crucified with Christ. Know it. There's the information. When he died, your old self died. The second thing, you have to reckon it. Reckon it true. Because God says 
that it is. And the third thing, you know, what do we have to do? Right? Now, now the, the concept of just sort of letting, let, letting go and letting God uh, do everything um, is not scriptural. It's not scriptural. Um, and I think it's to do with a misunderstanding about grace. Anybody know a guy called Dallas Willis here? Did you study him? A few of you guys. Put a quote. Great. Put a quote up from him. Look at this one. This is one of his ones here. He died a few years ago. Grace is not opposed to effort, which is action, but to earning, which is attitude. Absolutely amazing one. Now, let me just unpack that very, very quickly for us. When people say, I need this change in my life, you know, I'm not, obviously I'm, I can't do works. I'm a Christian. I can't earn my way to heaven. So I just lie in bed and, you know, and God's just going to zap me and I'm magically going to be changed. Well, no, no, you can cooperate with God. Amen. Grace isn't against effort, action, doing something, but it is against earning. If I do this, then God will bless me. You owe me now. I've been doing this. I prayed every morning this week. What are you going to give me? Earning. He's against earning, which is an attitude. He's not against effort. Lord, <laughs> give me the strength to tune in. He's not against it. It's a misconception. People sort of throw the baby out with the bathwater. Do you know what I'm saying about that with grace? The great uh, Dallas Willis with him. So we've got to do something. So what have we got to do? Let's get um, verse 12 up. Next, sorry, next slide, sorry. Here we go. It's a bit of a long one. Let's just do it quick. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin or as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. Now, we've got a responsibility, essentially. If we're Christians, we are new people. We're new people. We've been born again. And sin, unfortunately, is still looking for an instrument. wants to play us. So he's saying, don't hand over your body as instruments, which we used to do. And we used to use our tongues for things that weren't good. Our hands, our feet, our bodies. We gave it over to, to the other side. You know? but, but sin doesn't live in a vacuum, does it? It's expressed through our bodies. So he says, don't let sin reign in your mortal body. Now why would he say mortal? Why didn't he just say body? Don't let sin reign in your body. Why not mortal? It, it, I think it's probably because he wants to give us a reminder that the, our bodies is the part of us that hasn't been uh, yet saved. It's yet, it's yet to be saved. Romans 8, other places say we're waiting the redemption of our bodies. What's that bit? I often quote this when I go visiting uh, people, you know, generation, traditions above me. I say, look, while we're withering away on the outside, we're being renewed on the inside every day. Yeah? Exactly. Now we're going to get new bodies, aren't we, one day when Jesus comes to us or at the, at the resurrection of all things and live in, in, a, in, a, in a redeemed world. That's salvation future there. You know? But at the moment, I am a, I'm a new man inside a body that hasn't been saved. Does that make sense? Yeah. Make sense? See some of the battle here. Okay. So Paul's very practical. Don't let sin reign in your mortal body because sin's looking for an instrument. Don't do it. Make wise choices. You know, as a Christian, you, as a new person, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, yeah? Yeah, you notice if you haven't seen Jerusalem on TV or you visited Jerusalem, there's no temple there. There's the dome on the rock, the Muslim thing, isn't it, with the gold thing. There's no temple there. God no longer dwells in a temple in Jerusalem. Where does he dwell? Yeah, in us. Okay, so your body is the temple of God. So he says, make some wise decisions. There's a verse in Proverbs that talks about the wise man doesn't go down the street of a harlot. Have a look at this next verse. It's, I'm sort of flipping it there. I saw among the simple, and I noticed among uh, the young men, a youth who had no sense, so the opposite of being wise, a fool. He was going down the street near her corner, walking along the direction of your house at twilight, as the day was fading, at the dark of night set in. I mean, essentially saying, the wise man doesn't go down the street of a harlot, not late at night, you know, with a few pints down him. You know, be, be responsible. Well, you might say, but it's, it, it's the quickest way from getting to a, from a to B. But yeah, the harlot lives down there. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, but I can get there quicker. But don't do it to yourself. I think that's a word for someone here tonight. You know, sometimes, sometimes we have to look in the mirror, don't we, and, and just say, don't do it to yourself. Don't do it to yourself, mate. Don't. Don't do it. I just felt that was, I felt that was for someone here tonight. Okay. 
We're under new management. When we were under the old management, before we gave our lives to Jesus, we had less control. We had a different manager, didn't we? And he was using our bodies for all sorts of stuff that was creating chaos in the world. It wasn't bringing shalom in the world, it was bringing uh, destruction. But now we're under new management. I gave an illustration to someone the other day, it's a great one. Um, uh, Gareth Bale. People know football players, Gareth Bale, Welsh football player, used to play for um, Tottenham Hotspurs. Harry Redlock was the manager. He got sold, uh, Gareth Bale got sold to Real Madrid in Spain for what was then the biggest transfer deal of all time, 85 million um, pounds. They paid the price for him to get him out of West Ham to go to there. He's got new management. Zinedine Zidane is the manager there. Now what happens if Harry Redknapp rings him up on the phone? All right, Gareth, I'd be good to see if you can come down and do a bit of training and blah, blah. He's like, but you ain't my boss anymore. I'm under new management. Do you know what I mean? I was bought for a price. The biggest price that's ever been paid. Do you know what I'm saying? No, 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 but if you can just do this and we'll do a few moves and stuff and blah. I'm under new management. Are you with me? Are we preaching now? Are we getting there? You're under new management now and you don't have to answer to that call when it calls you. You don't have to. The power's uh, being broken. Don't make an opportunity. It's like that joke, um, uh, the little boy and, and, and his mum tells him, you're not going swimming. He says, okay, I'm not going, mum. And she's on the phone and he runs past her with a towel under his arm. And she says, I just thought I told you you're not going swimming. He says, yeah, but when I get down there, you know, if I feel like going, at least I'll, I'll have the, the towel in case I need to. Don't make opportunity, isn't it? Take responsibility for your members. But let's wrap this up. Um, let's do a little, a little closing then. Next, next, next section here. Okay. We'll come to the end of the passage. Slaves to righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, yeah? You used to have a different management. Harry Redknapp's crew. Now you're with Zinedine Zidane. Though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin. Say that with me. You have been set free from sin, yeah? And have become slaves to righteousness. Okay, let me put the words of a Bob Dylan song up. You've got to save somebody. Look at this one. Bob Dylan. I'm not going to do my Bob Dylan voice. But you have to serve. <laughs> but you have to serve somebody. Yes, indeed. You're going to have to serve somebody. Well, it may be the devil, or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. Now, apparently, John Lennon really disliked um, Dylan's implication there that there's no third way. I mentioned it, didn't we? You're either with, you're either with Adam's crew or you're with Jesus' crew. Everyone's always looking for a third way. It's like when Jesus says he's the gate to enter. You're either outside of the gate or, or you're in the pen. People say, oh, I'm sitting on the fence. You're not. You're not. There is no place to sit there. And, and so John Lennon, he wrote an alternative to this called Serve Yourself. Look at the John Lennon one. There you go, look. You've got to serve yourself. Ain't nobody going to do it for you. You've got to serve yourself. Ain't nobody going to do it for you. Well, you may be in, in devils or believe in devils. You may believe in lords, but you're going to have to serve yourself and that's all there is to it. Both of those guys realised something, didn't they? Both Dylan and, uh, and John Lennon. That we're all slaves to something. We're all, we're all serving something. Next slide. It's the same one we just had in Romans. Next slide, please. Yeah, just leave it up there. We just read that one there. A Christian, it says there, is a slave uh, to righteousness. It, it's not an idea, something to attain to. It doesn't say, then you will be. No, 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 you are a slave to righteousness. Yeah, you used to be a slave to sin, and now you've become a slave again, but a slave to righteousness. It's an announcement of who you are. I've brought a little rope to give you an illustration now. Imagine, this is how you used to be. Right? You're a slave to sin. And sin's pulling you around here, there, and everywhere, yeah? And sin, he takes you down, he takes you down the slave market. And you're down the slave market, and righteousness comes by. And righteousness says, oh, I'm prepared to pay the price. I'm prepared to pay the price. And he takes that off. He says, well, you're a slave to righteousness now. There you go. What a way to be bought for a price. Bought for a price. You were a slave to sin, but you're no longer a slave to sin. Now you're a slave to righteousness. We die to sin 
Because when we were in Christ, he died. We might not recollect it, but the Bible says it's true. Your old self, your old man was crucified with him. And he that's dead is free from sin, so consider it to be true. Now what happens when you sin? You come back to God and you say, sorry, I acted out of character. Yeah? Out of character. Because you're not a sinner being made righteous. You're a righteous person who sins sometimes. Yeah? And you carry on. We don't abandon the gospel because we have a bad day. And if we haven't had a change of identity, then we're in real trouble. We close with this, and this is our last illustration, and we'll pray. Okay. Now, I bought this months ago for this. Don't ask me, okay? You can see him? We'll put him here. Okay. See him. This is a pig. Can you see him there? He's leaning forward. He's got the up. Okay, so we say, hello, what's your name? He says, pig. Um, and I say, all right, are you all right, pig? And he says, oink. So I say to him, okay, pig. That's your identity, yeah? That's your identity, pig. Okay, oink. Now fly. Well, he's going to be the most miserable pig that ever lived, isn't he? Because his identity and his calling, they don't match up, do they? Now, is that what God has done to us? He's called us to be holy, called us to be righteous, but hasn't empowered us to be able... Is that what he's done? No. No, he hasn't, has he? He hasn't done that at all. It's not out of reach. He says, I've made you a new creation. I've placed you in Christ. I've freed you from sin's power. There's no temptation that's too great for you. I'll always make a way of escape. I am calling you to newness of life. Okay, this is the end. Put this last quote up. Many of you will know this one. John Bunyan. What does he say? He's talking about the Ten Commandments, the Old Testament law. Run, John, run. The law commands but neither gives you feet nor hands. Better news the gospel brings. It bids us fly. Let me ask you to stand and we'll pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you took our place. You bore our shame. You broke the power of cancelled sin. You set the prisoner free. We're so grateful that we're not living under the law that tells us to run but doesn't give us any strength. Better news the gospel brings. Bids us fly and gives us wings. Father, I pray for your children here this evening that you would profoundly persuade them about your lavish grace, that they would know, because you said it's true, that their old self was crucified with Jesus, that they've died to sin, that they would reckon it, they consider it to be true, they change the watch, and they take responsibility. Holy Spirit, bless this word to us, that the word become flesh, that it would become life to us. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Hallelujah.